Hello and welcome to the Federal Society's virtual event. This afternoon, May 24th, 2022, we discuss college admissions, fair or fixed. My name is Ryan Lacey and I'm Assistant Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of our experts on today's call. Today we are fortunate to have an excellent panel moderated by Allison Soman, who I'll introduce very briefly. Allison is a legal fellow at the Center for the Separation of Powers at the Pacific Legal Foundation. Before joining, joining PLF, Allison was a special assistant and counsel for over a decade to Gail Harriet, a member of the bipartisan United States Commission of, on Civil Rights. Allison was a Koch associate at the National Federation for Independent, Independent Business Legal Foundation, and during law school completed a summer clerkships at the Institute Institute for Justice and the Charles G. Cope Charitable Foundation. She holds a JD from Emory University School of Law and an AB in History from Dartmouth College. After our speakers give their remarks, we will turn to you, the audience, for questions. If you have a question, please enter it into our Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we will handle questions as we can towards the end of today's program. With that, thank you for being with us today. Allison, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Ryan, and welcome to the audience to today's webinar, College Admissions Fair or Fixed. Some background on the topics that we're going to discuss today. As the Supreme Court prepares to hear two cases this fall that challenge race preferential admissions policies at Harvard University and the University of North Carolina, questions have arisen about how colleges typically use race preferences and whether such use is fair and lawful. Today, the panelists will address how and when race is commonly used in college admissions, whether colleges and universities are generally following existing law, and what, if any, safeguards colleges use to ensure that line admissions officers use race only to further legally permissible goals. The panelists will also discuss what some find the surprising fact that Asian American applicants are more likely to be displaced by race preferential admissions policies than are white applicants, and they'll discuss whether this practice is fair and lawful. Finally, the presenters may also address the commonness and fairness of other non-academic factors widely used in admissions, such as preferences for legacies, recruited athletes, or the children of donors. There are more extensive biographies listing the impressive credentials of today's two panelists on the FedSoc website, but let me take a moment to briefly introduce them. Art Coleman, who will speak first today, leads the legal and policy work of the College Board's Access and Diversity Collaborative, which he helped establish in 2004. He's been a principal author of numerous, amic numerous amicus briefs filed in federal courts on issues associated with the educational benefits of student diversity and the consideration of race and admissions. Mr. Coleman also currently teaches at the USC Rossier School of Education. Previously, he was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights during the Clinton administration, following a tenure there as Senior Policy Advisor to the Assistant Secretary. He's an Honors Graduate of Duke University School of Law and a Phi Beta Kappa Graduate of the University of Virginia. Second, we'll hear from Mr. Corey Liu. Mr. Liu is a partner at the Ashcroft Law Firm. He previously served as Assistant General Counsel to Texas Governor Greg Abbott. Mr. Liu clerked for Judge Andrew Oldham on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit and for Judge Danny Boggs on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. He was editor-in-chief of the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy in Law School and is a graduate of Harvard Law School and the University of Chicago. And with that, uh, the floor is yours, Mr. Holman. Thanks so much. I appreciate you having me today, and I look forward to the conversation. Um, I'm going to kick us off. I've been asked to reflect on sort of my years and work with the admissions field to get a sense of what's going on behind the proverbial closed doors. Um, and I'd like to kick off um, by just saying this is based on both my perspective from my federal um, policy and enforcement days, as well as the work I do with national associations and institutions of higher education um, as a matter of professional development and, and policy design. Um, one of my biggest um, concerns over time has actually been what I perceive to be the, the disconnect between the public understanding of what reality is and what is actually going on behind closed doors on issues of admissions. I think that plays into some of the legal arguments um, um, that we may be facing um, coming up. But I think uh, the fundamentals are um, really um, grounded in both principles of 
good admissions practice uh, for the field that are generally adhered to, um, as well as some of the legal principles that I think are, are front and center on the cases that um, Allison mentioned a few minutes ago. And I wanna hit on, on sort of three core points around what my perspective is around what the field is doing when it is um, adhering to not only best practice, but legally compliant practice, um, going all the way back to Tabaki and then Gruder and Gratz. Um, one is, an authentic, individualized, holistic review process to an undergirding of rigor regarding analysis, evaluation, um, and three, um, uh, an ongoing process of continuous improvement. I think one of the federal district courts in the, the cases we're gonna talk about um, said more than once, in fact, perfection was not the standard. Um, I've adhered to that principle for decades because I think this is not a, we're dealing with human judgment we're dealing with an assessment of multiple factors and multiple interests. Um, and I think you've got a profession that's committed to getting it as good as they can get it, but there's always a, a point of continuous improvement and I'll talk about that for a bit. Let me start with what I think is really the cornerstone of good admissions design, which is individualized holistic review. Um, it's not um, mechanical, it's not formulaic in any real sense, I think it reflects a couple of factors. One, a range of consideration of multiple intersecting factors, student accomplishments, potential at the institution, unique interests, importantly, the context in which the student has, has been brought up and educated, what opportunities they had, what opportunities they didn't have. That sort of big global picture is really fundamental to understanding um, good decision-making in the admissions context far selected institutions. And, and I should say that um, based on some research, the individualized holistic review, I think um, the latest data I've seen um, reflects, is reflected in about 90% of the institutions that consider themselves selective um, throughout the United States. Um, one of the points here I think to emphasize is the just vast array of factors that can play into an admissions decision. Uh, the College Board Models Project from the early 2000s identified through some very rigorous um, work in the field, 30 academic and almost seven, 70 non-academic factors um, that calls to mind that I think in the UNC case, they identified something like 40 factors um, at play in, in, in their admissions decision. So I think bottom line, no two applicants are ever um, identical. No two applicants are ever presenting the, the same credentials um, are the same degree of fit even for a particular institution. Um, it's really about not only what they've achieved, but the context in which they've achieved it. In this sort of broad big point on individualized holistic review, um, let me drill down to two fundamental questions that I think are often um, a point of contention to be sure, um, and sometimes misunderstood. One's the question of merit, um, and one's the question that is the centerpiece of the cases going to the Supreme Court this fall, um, the consideration of race. Um, I think you will find you, this is universally true with institutions of higher education that are selected, and it is certainly grounded in the psycho, both psychometric principles generally and the test use guidance that's put out by the College Board and ACT. Merit is never defined by test scores and grades, period, end of sentence. Uh, test scores, um, according to test publishers, are limited, imperfect, and not exact even if they are important measures that must be considered along with other factors as a foundation for a high stakes decision like an admissions decision. Um, so that test score should never be considered the sole or even the principal factor, notwithstanding their importance. And it's important to understand that test scores are never judged in isolation. They are, they are evaluated in the context of the entire student application, going back to this notion of individualized holistic review. The second point on the, on the question of race, um, in my experience and from what I've both deduced from work with institutions and the work I've done with national organizations on this one, the consideration of race can't and should not be mechanical. It should not reflect a kind of systemic weighting. Um, I return to both the, the Gruder and Gratz divide in 2003 where the court on the one hand upheld this authentic individualized holistic review where race could be one factor integrated among other factors versus the more mechanical, rigid point system that was um, struck down. 
And I think it's really important to recognize, and I think this is an important factor when you understand the dimensions of, of holistic review, trying to understand the totality of the applicant's background and experience, that race enters in through facets around their life experience, their self-identity and the like. So it's really not when done well and appropriately, and I think in legally compliant ways, a check the box or a status demarcation but one that is reflective of the, the entire story and picture of the applicant. So the last point I'll make on the individualized holistic review is simply that um, the question of evaluation is not just about the four corners of the application. Admissions officers, yes, are doing that in earnest, but they are also charged with assembling a class. And part of that question of assembling a class is how do you achieve your institutional goals? How do you create the mix of students that will enhance the, the learning, the dialogue, the challenge from different backgrounds and experiences? And I think that's a big piece that sometimes gets missed, um, particularly in the headlines. So let me quickly, that's sort of individualized review, holistic review in a, in a nutshell, if you will. Um, let me turn to then um, very quickly, the two other elements I mentioned, the sort of the process of rigor. There's a lot that goes into a design around an admissions policy and, and process and implementation, both addressing sort of mission-driven institutional goals, understanding that admissions is part of a broader enrollment management strategy that involves everything from outreach and recruitment to financial and aid and scholarships. So there are fundamental business decisions here. Uh, keeping the lights on um, is, is part of that. Um, but they're also integrated within other design elements. And that, in my experience, that's both research-based tied to not only sort of broad research, but what institutional experience is over time, what they are achieving, where their goals aren't met, part of this continuous improvement. And it's really grounded in um, a notion of professional judgment um, that's further enhanced by ongoing training um, ongoing cal calibration about different factors and decisions. Um, and part of the uh, process is also um, very much integrated with input from boards of trustees, presidents, provosts, and the like and faculty, not just a cluster of folks in an admissions office. Then finally, back to my, my point that um, you know, profession, uh, perfection is not um, the, the ultimate goal here because that's an impossible goal when you've got human judgment at play. Um, there is a very dedicated, robust effort, typically you see it in the summer cycles, where there is an evaluation of what went right, what went wrong, what needs to be adjusted, what needs to be fixed. Uh, not only looking at both the um, how did we do in our admission cycle, but now what is the experience and what are the outcomes associated with student experience and success. And so it's a very dynamic, ongoing process that's very, it's not a static one and done. Um, it is a process that is subject of ongoing evaluation, ongoing questioning, ongoing challenging, and that's part of the experience. Let me stop there, Allison. I think that gives a, a, a picture of the, the basic um, foundation as I've experienced it. Thank you. Um, on that note, we'll now turn to Corey Liu. Thank you, Allison, and thanks, Art, for that um, description of how the admissions process is at least conceived of and how it's supposed to work. I think, you know, my reaction is that uh, despite the best of intentions, if we presume that those uh, at these universities who are making these decisions are, are trying to implement all of those policies that you just described, those goals, that there's still going to be problems. And not only that those problems are just in the implementation of it, but that it's inherent into that way of approaching admissions. Um, I think the let me start with uh, something that kind of an interesting insight that I got um, when I was having a discussion with Professor Sanford Levinson at the University of Texas at Austin here when I did a, a Federal Society event back in 2018. And he actually expressed some agreement with some of my criticisms of how uh, race conscious holistic admissions has happened, which is that there's sort of an inherent flaw in this pursuit of diversity that Gruder uh, put a stamp of approval on. Uh, who counts as diverse? Which categories do you look at, right? Ultimately, as individuals, there are so many factors that make us unique. There are, everybody in some sense could be said to have certain advantages or disadvantages. Uh, 
I mean, not just race or sex, but your your personal health, your all sorts of infinite factors that um, don't necessarily break down in the typical identity politics way. But because of the way politics works, some of these identity factors will get more emphasis than others. And because there's so many factors that make us unique as individuals, um, it's impossible really to to define diversity in a way that ultimately doesn't have the effect of excluding some people. And so what Professor Levinson, his sort of example to concretize this is, he said, I would have liked to have seen more Middle Eastern Muslim students um, at the University of Texas, but that group isn't really prioritized, isn't thought of as a particularly important mission for the admissions policy, and so that they're not really thought of. And of course, under the way the census classifies people based on race, they would be treated as white. Um, and so you, you see certain categories that are emphasized in sort of touting how, what the diversity accomplishments are of the university, right? You look at schools, uh, demographic breaks down, it'll usually be race and then sex. And so, and then they have a particular set of racial categories that they use, which uh, in an amicus brief that I submitted to the Supreme Court uh, on behalf of Professor Bernstein, we argue that those categories are over-inclusive, under-inclusive, you know, why are all Asians lumped together as one group, um, things like that. But th those are the categories that have just come from initially from federal bureaucrats and then universities, because they already had that data they were providing for the Department of Education. Um, they, you know, they just use that and they, and they tout that. And, and that drives a lot of what they're uh, looking at in the admissions policy. So what came out in the Harvard uh, admissions lawsuit is that they had these one pagers and so continuously throughout the admissions process, they were tracking based on these typical racial categories that we all know of and monitoring the demographics. And then at the end, when they've kind of almost come figured out all people they're going to give offers to, if there's too many, they'll do a lopping process. And again, you can see some in discovery, some email correspondence about, you know, we're about to do the lopping, send me the ethnic statistics. So uh, those you end up with certain categories that we're all familiar with that are prioritized. And again, it often is political considerations. Um, you know, if, if, if the numbers don't look a certain way, which groups are going to protest, which are groups are going to have uh, an influence in terms of criticizing it? What's the media going to be attacking? Oh, well, you didn't have this many students of, of this background, right? You, you can see this in the headlines on Twitter, uh, which groups get emphasized. And so you have this dynamic that, you know, some will call the, the victimhood Olympics or the victimhood hierarchy where some groups uh, get more attention, others do not. Um, you, you can hear this in you know, the way politicians sometimes give shout outs to different groups and they'll, they'll list a few. And then of course, you know, Asians are almost never mentioned because we're a relatively small group. A lot of us are immigrants, non-citizens, not voting. Um, and so they, in terms of politics, they've just never really been prioritized and, and often overlooked. And so that's, you know, for me, what got me interested in this subject ever since I applied for college um, you know, around the same time as Abigail Fisher, uh, I, I'm hearing the rhetoric of, of we're trying to include everyone and, and produce a diverse student body. And yet my own personal experience was, you know, I'm the son of immigrants. We didn't speak you know, English at home, faced a lot of the discrimination uh, that immigrants face, and it, it was challenging. And yet in the admissions process, I had this feeling that, well, we can see there's, we have enough Asians, right? In terms of looking at all of America or all of Texas, uh, we have an idea of what diversity looks like. And that means you, we look at you in proportion to your representation in the population. So you hear phrases like overrepresented or underrepresented, right? They, they didn't say overrepresented <laughs> as much because that would uh, sound discriminatory, but they would talk about underrepresented groups. And I think it's inherent in this game of looking at different identities that if you're gonna give extra weight to certain groups who in your mind um, need a, a boost because they're underrepresented, that people who don't belong to that group, it's gonna have an exclusionary effect on them. And what the Harvard case highlights is, and often in the debate, you would hear phrases like reverse discrimination or things about, you know, white, why are white people complaining about this? And what we're seeing here is that actually Asian Americans uh, in fact, we are such a small minority group that they don't even get mentioned in the Supreme Court opinions, right? In, in Grutter, there's no, no discussion about the extent to which Asian Americans uh, might be penalized by the policy. And then in 2014, in the uh, Michigan affirmative action case where Michigan passed a constitutional amendment at the state level um, requiring race not to be considered, that was then challenged by supporters of, of race conscious policies. 
And it went to the Supreme Court who said that Michigan may pass a constitutional amendment uh, along these lines, but Justice Sotomayor wrote a dissent and she talked about how removing these policies would have a detrimental effect on minority admissions. And she pointed to uh, schools in California where California had passed a similar constitutional amendment at the state level. And she, she didn't have any discussion of Asians at all, right? So perhaps some minority groups, maybe the numbers changed uh, in a way that decreased the population, but then there were also other minority groups that uh, had a, a, a greater chance for admissions just because they're being treated equally to students of other races, their race isn't being used to penalize them. And her, her opinion doesn't even mention Asians as existing at all. I don't know if it was uh, negligence or uh, some kind of selective desire to highlight rhetorically without considering some of the challenges of her position. But um, I, I think that's where we see the ultimate inevitable flaw in this kind of holistic approach that um, they're, inevitably you're prioritizing some people over other people based on factors that we as a society through our constitution have determined may not be considered, uh, such as race. Um, and yet the Supreme Court carved out a, a, a little bit of, allowing a little bit of use of that policy, but then you can even see in the Grutter opinion it is internally conflicted, whether it's Justice O'Connor's uh, putting a 25 year mark and saying, we know these policies can't go on forever, even though the diversity rationale sounds like something that could justify these kind of policies indefinitely, you see her uncomfortable. Well, we can't do this forever. This, this, we have to put a limit on. Um, and, and the idea that you would reject either a quota or a mechanical use of race, but then still allow for critical mass. Um, for a lot of commentators have pointed out, all, all you're saying is that you, you can try to achieve some goals as long as you're not explicit and clear about what they are or how you're doing it. And so obviously there still is considerations of, of the numbers like these one pages that Harvard were using, and they were trying to replicate those year after year because as the evidence showed for roughly 20 year period that was examined by the plaintiffs, the number of Asians remained the same, the number of all the different demographic group, groups pretty much remained mechanically the same year after year. And so uh, I, I, I'm not sure there is a way to, to do this in, uh, that um, will we'll achieve what the critics, uh, the people who support these diversity policies want, which is they ultimately want the numbers to look a certain way. And so if you just use race or, or other factors just a little bit, you may not necessarily get the exact numbers or outcome that you want and, and you'll face the criticism. And so inevitably, there's going, you're gonna be reduced down to this mechanical consideration, whether it's quotas or whatever, and you just may not be stating it as explicitly or honestly. I think that's a lot of the resentment that I've felt going through this myself and that a lot of Asian Americans and, and other folks who've been interested in this lawsuit is you hear the rhetoric, it sounds nice. Then you look at the reality of how it's implemented. And at the end of the day, there are these judgment calls and there are biases as to what uh, factors contribute to diversity. And I'm not necessarily arguing for uh, only tests. I think there are potential advantages to using only tests or, or tests and grades which is that it strips away a lot of the potential biases. Um, for example, the discrimination against Jews that was at Harvard before Asians, um, just explicit references about you, you wouldn't want there to be too many Jews or even the Jews wouldn't want to be there anymore. That kind of thinking, um, when you, if you go to just pure academics, I'm not saying it's, it, it's fair in every respect or somehow that, that uh, is, the, is the best way to judge who you are as a person, but it is a way that everyone is judged in a uniform manner that removes bias. But even if you don't look at that, um, you know, I, I think uh, uh, we still have to be ultimately aware of that this diversity goal, uh, there's no way to implement it in a way that doesn't ultimately have some sort of exclusionary effect on some groups. Um, and I think that's why as long as these policies are in effect, people are gonna continue to raise challenges to them. You're gonna have problems like what happened at Harvard where, Theoretically, you're supposed to be using race just a little bit, but it seems like every year they're, they've already predetermined the racial balance of the class. Um, so I think uh, this, the case does a very good job of, of illustrating that problem, and, and we'll see what the Supreme Court does. Um, so, Allison, can I just do a, a couple points of response? Sure. In fact, I was just about to ask both of you if you each want to take a moment to respond to what the other has said. Sure. Um, so, Corey, I appreciate the perspective, um, and there's a lot in what you said that I think um, 
to the extent that it reflects an institutional decision where there are these sort of categorical rules or even quotas or sort of a sense of, you know, all Asian Americans are lumped into one category, which is problematic in and of itself um, in the way you described it, um, I think would be problematic. But I think I'd want to say this. Um, number one, just as a reminder and a grounding point that the diversity interests that are the foundation for all of this are actually well beyond race and ethnicity, of which race and ethnicity are a, are a piece. Um, and we shouldn't lose that. And I would say, um, I, I would say a, a lot of the ways in which institutions sometimes talk about these issues, you talked about sort of the websites and the, how they report on their class becomes very categorical. Um, that can certainly lend itself to that understanding. I will tell you from my experience, um, that kind of rigid or systemic or um, mechanical lens is not the reality when you are looking at the, the, the authentic individual in a context. Um, again, that's not to say they're outliers. I can't speak for all of higher education. Um, but I can say that I, I think that's um, really what's part of it because it's not going into individualized holistic review and saying, um, is this student an Asian American or is this student um, Black or is this student Hispanic? It's actually going to see what the lived experience and background and perspectives and interests um, may be that could easily be associated with that that will bring some richness to the dynamic about this learning community you're, you're looking for. And I think ultimately we've got to acknowledge that the, the reality is um, the aim for the institution is to assemble a robust class. And by design, they want students from a vast array of backgrounds um, and experiences. And that's going to mean some judgments of who gets in, who doesn't. To your point on the, the test scores and grades, um, if Harvard had gone to, I think based on the data, if Harvard had gone to just a you know top SAT um, score um, criterion, they would have knocked out a lot of perfect SAT scores because there are more perfect SAT scores in the record than they are admitting in any one class. So these are human judgments at an ultimate level around the profiles of the students. Um, and again, I'll acknowledge that sometimes the way we talk about it and the way we frame it and, and even the way that websites articulate, here's our class for the coming year, overly simplify and overly categorize um, the, the complexity and the richness of the decision-making that's going on there. My response to that is that um, I actually really think the insights of implicit bias that have been raised in recent years and which came out in the Harvard case uh, show that what some might consider to be a rich holistic admissions, others would find to be a limited uh, biased process, right? There's a, I think everybody carries with them, every reviewer carries with them their own personal experiences, their own uh, judgments based on who they are. And that everyone's limited in that respect because we don't have the life experiences of so many different people. And so uh, this is where you see, for, for instance, in a lot of Justice Thomas's opinion, um, this sort of resentment of the purportedly well-meaning white liberal who actually is not seeing a lot of the complexity of what's going on. And so uh, the great thing about this lawsuit, I think, is that it's given a voice to a lot of Asian Americans, journalists, writers who've been telling these stories that honestly, I, I would Google and I would never find anything like this. But because of this case, so many have come out and written really interesting and thoughtful pieces that really resonated with me, including people who would not identify as conservative or politically kind of uh, trying to disrupt the system. They're just Asian Americans just describing their stories. So if I could just read um, a couple excerpts, um, I have two. One is Professor Jeannie Sook Gerson. She's a Harvard Law School um, a professor there. She talks about how uh, she would, the, admission, the application process for schools, fellowships, and jobs always came with a ritual. A person who had a role in choosing me, an admissions officer, an interviewer, would mention in his congratulations that I was different from the other Asians. When I won a scholarship that paid for part of my education, a selection panelist told me that I got it because I had moving qualities of heart and originality that Asian applicants generally lacked. Asian applicants were also alike, and I stood out. In truth, I wasn't really much different from other Asians I knew. I was shy and reticent, played a musical instrument, spent summers drilling math, and had strict parents to whom I was dutiful. But I got the message. To be allowed through a narrow door, an Asian should cultivate not just a sense of individuality, but also ways to project not like other Asians. Um, the other article is by Aaron Mack um, from Slate, and he talks about how I carefully manicured my identity to cater to the admissions committee. 
but that effort also involved erasing it in order to appear white or at least less Asian. I chose to leave the optional race and ethnicity blank in the form, a practice common among Asian applicants. I assumed Mac isn't a popularly named, known uh, Chinese surname in the US. My dad used to jokingly point out that it's one letter off from the Gaelic surname Mac, M-A-C-K. Maybe an oblivious admissions officer would mistake me for Scottish. I didn't tell my father how much I'd hoped our family would be misread. I marked my intended major as philosophy, thinking this was one of those impractical fields that most sensible Asian parents would not allow their children to pursue. I had no intention of actually following through. I avoided, the, another excerpt from the same piece, I avoided participating in the Future Doctors Association, Ping Pong Club, the robotics team, and the Asian culture group. I quit piano, viewing the instrument as a totem of my race's overeager striving in America. I opted to spend much of my time writing plays and film, uh, film reviews. Pursuits I genuinely did find rewarding, but which I also chose so I wouldn't be pigeonholed. I enrolled in a Mandarin course during my senior year of high school, never having learned a Chinese dialect as a kid, but I dropped it a few weeks in. I told the people it was because I was too busy, but in actuality, I didn't want Mandarin on my transcript and as a second language on my application, which I feared could be a red flag for the admissions committee. And so I think what you're seeing here is that there's there, in trying to please the admissions officers, uh, many Asian Americans are actually feeling like they have to erase their own sense of identity and who they are as a person in order to basically consider what, what they think a white person would find interesting. And this is certainly something that I experienced and felt when I applied for college. And that I honestly, if you just Googled and, and whatnot, you, you wouldn't find any discussion of this from any of the folks who were in power, the university administrators, the judges who had judicial review, who were empowered to apply our civil rights equal protection laws. And so I think this case has, again, it's brought to light so many of these important experiences. Um, and I think it does show that, that there is discrimination against Asians, that Asians have been overlooked for decades. Um, you know, whether the court does what I consider to be the right thing, uh, we will see, uh, but I'm hopeful that they do. And, and even if they don't, I think, there's going to be discussion that was generated um, will make these policies never be seen the same again. I think um, the, whatever opinions come out of that will will engage with these issues. And, and for me, that's you know that 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 leaves me with a good feeling. And I, and I think um, I think if, if these policies are ultimately upheld, the, the litigation will continue because inevitably these considerations of factors again, some of which end up getting prioritized over others because just of the the finite number of factors that can be considered um, and, and, the, and the inevitable prioritization that comes to that. I don't think this ideal of let's treat everyone as an individual is ever going to be possible um, because of politics, because of human biases, because of the way these get implemented. And so um, I think fundamentally, you know, there are factors other than race, but race has become such a politicized topic and our constitution's equal protection clause, if it protects any identity from discrimination, it is race. And so I think, you know, we can talk about other, I know the description for the event we talked about also um, just the fairness of admissions in general and legacy. And I, I find that very problematic as well. But when people ask, you know, why aren't you focused on legacy? I, first of all, I say I, I would, if I was a congressman, I would vote to defund universities that uh, use legacy because I think it's a corrupting practice. It's basically to perpetuate the wealth and privilege of the university through, through their connections. Um, I don't think we should be publicly funding any institution that does that. But the Constitution does have an equal protection clause. We do have civil rights laws that specifically were passed to address race discrimination. So I think Asians do have a legitimate grievance here based on their experiences uh, under these policies since Grutter. Let me, let me just pick up on one point, I think, Corey, that I think we could agree on when you were describing sort of the, the student or the applicant who feels like they've got to present themselves as something that they are not authentically like that. That's painful to me personally. I've lived this space. Um, I care about this process a lot. Um, but it is also in my mind sort of antithetical to what this really should be all about, which is the individual identity and dignity of the individual. And that really ties back into uh, to take it back to a legal context, the 14th Amendment, like I think the Equal Protection Clause is grounded in the notion of the individual. I, we've had an evolution of law over decades on that, but I think we are now about the individual and the dignity of the individual. Um, and I will say one of my concerns um, about the ongoing litigation and the request beyond just the facts of the case uh, 
to sort of wipe out any consideration of, of race or ethnicity in admissions as, as um, SFFA um, seeks to do in this case is the notion that you would lose the ability for a student to tell his or her story. You would lose the ability for a student to say, this is who I authentically am. And that should be considered as part of the um, calculus in the admissions decision. Um, and I think that's um, the dignity of the individual is at core. Um, the authenticity of being able to tell your story is at core. Um, and I'm, I'm bothered by anything that would cut against the grain on that. Corey, did you want to respond to that? Uh, no, I think I think we've had a good discussion. I don't know if you want to go any questions or. So I jotted down a couple of questions of my own, and then um, depending upon how much time we have left, we can move on to audience questions. Uh, Art kicked off his remarks by noting that there's an ideal that holistic admissions should approach, but that it often does imperfectly of true, full, individualized consideration. I'm curious how closely you both think the typical selective college admissions process approaches that individual holistic ideal, and whether you think that the two admissions processes at Harvard and University of North Carolina that are subject to challenge, how well you think that those proceed that those universities' procedures approximate that ideal of true individualized holistic consideration. I'll jump in. I, um, I'll say I don't think there is any typical university when I go behind closed doors with um, institutions. I, the first thing they tell me is we're different and we're unique. And that's actually authentically true. Like everyone's got a different mission. Everyone's got a different design, but they operate within these parameters. My general experience has been, um, are there tweaks and refinements that are often um, necessary and important to make in this continuous improvement model? Of course, but the fundamentals are there because um, in my experience, and you alluded to this in my background at the outset, uh, literally I helped form the Access and Diversity Collaborative in 2004 following a meeting of 60 admissions deans who were reacting to Grutter and grants and trying to figure out what do we do next. It was literally an enterprise to say, we've got the rules of the road. Now the question is, how do you integrate that in your design? So not just that I'm following the law, but literally the law is integrated in the policy and practice. Um, and that's been the work um, I've helped lead for um, a decade and a half. So I think that is really uh, an important feature to understand in this um, broader context. Um, I, I've not read all of the record in Harvard and UNC. Um, I'm basing my judgments on some of the briefs and then ultimately the district court opinions, which are heavily um, factually um, detailed as well as the one appellate decision. Um, I see the hallmarks of individualized holistic review. I see the hallmarks of the consideration of race as part of the uh, entire applicant um, in those cases. Well, I think you probably know where I, I stand on this, but I, I don't think, uh, in my mind, the question is, are they sincerely trying their best or do they deep down inside know what they're doing is wrong and nonetheless feel compelled because that's what their job is, that's what the Supreme Court has said, to, to frame their process in a certain way. Um, but even, even assuming that they're, the intentions of these uh, admissions officers are the best and they're doing their best, I think the mission is hopelessly doomed because, as I mentioned, the implicit bias, um, the, there's just too many factors to consider. And so, for instance, I, the lack of transparency, I think, to me, is indicative that deep down inside, the people who are doing this know it's a doomed or, or, or there's certain intractable flaws that can't be discussed because it would be too uncomfortable. So for instance, if I, I I've never, I, I, I often write and I often you know, talk about this issue, but I've never actually sat down with, for instance, with um, Miguel Wasilewski, the admissions director at the University of Texas. And, and if I were to tell him, did you know that there are Asian students who are intentionally not learning their own language or trying to erase that aspect of their identity? because they know that people like you are gonna think that there's too many of us and what kind of psychological and dignitary harm that inflicts on us and that is 100% sincere. I think he would look, he would listen and say, that, that's terrible. There's also a lot of other people who, you know, that, but what about this? What about that, right? And so inevitably, I think a lot of Asian Americans where the frustration grows is we talk about our lived experiences, our uh, the discrimination that we face, 
And what we get is a look of, well, you guys are doing okay. You guys seem to be doing fine relative to your, your people, whatever slice of the population we judge you against. And then are these other groups where we feel worse about it. And so again, as I said, uh, that's where you can kind of see an undercurrent a lot of Justice Thomas's opinions of this resentment of the sort of privileged white liberal who is appoints themselves the arbiter of who is most deserving of sympathy and, and additional attention and consideration. And then the inevitable result that some people are gonna feel excluded by that process. Um, and so I, I think, I, I would say that I, I think probably, you know, the, the folks in these universities are trying to do their best. I mean, they're, they're told what the mission is and they're, they're trying to execute it. But I feel like on a deep down level inside, they know that they're making these judgment calls that if it was perfectly transparent would make people very uncomfortable. So for, for instance, in the University of North Carolina case, which is a companion case to the Harvard case of the Supreme Court right now, um, there's one exchange, you can see a text message where one person says, uh, 2,400 perfect SAT. The other person says, wow, Brown? And the other person says, uh, no, Asian. And of course, that uh, setting aside the crassness of the discussion, I mean, I think a lot of people who are classified as Asian actually would also identify as brown, such as those from India, South Asian countries. But you're seeing that that's, that's what we're dealing with. These are, and these are human beings, they're imperfect, and the categories and criteria they're told to implement are imperfect. But I, I think if, if they were given the truth serum and they were honestly talking about what they were doing, it would be, it, it would come off as so flawed, so biased, so limited, so inevitably, intractably um, uh, dehumanizing as you're trying to weigh these factors and, and think who do we feel is most underprivileged or who looks the most different from the typical person at this profile, that it would just, it would outrage people and it, the whole system would come crumbling, which is why Harvard fought so hard in discovery to keep so much information out and, and these cases get delayed because I think you, you can't, there's just no way to talk about how it really honestly works behind the scenes without uh, engendering a lot of, you know, criticism and, and resentment. Can I, let me just say this in response to that on, on the point of transparency, which um, resonates for me. I, I will be the first to say, I don't think higher ed community writ large has done a good enough job about being transparent about our processes and practices. And there's a whole conversation um, about that. But that said, um, it is also um, a deliberative um, judgment around lots of factors that are unique and tied to private confidential student files. Like the notion that you would be perfectly transparent about who's getting in and who's not, forget the issues of race and ethnicity. You'd have chaos tomorrow because at a fundamental level, as my admissions friends constantly remind me, it's fair if... I got in and it's not fair if I didn't, right? Um, and so there is this lens and this layer of complexity that goes into the, the um, mix of decision-making that I think I've been an advocate for more transparency over time. Um, but that sort of perfect transparency, you know, at some point then funnel the applications into some computer and let test scores and grades be the defining feature, which I think totally um, would, would um, destroy the process and is not any notion of authentic merit um, for reasons I've alluded to. Um, but I don't want to see us get there either. Could you elaborate a little bit more about ways in which the admissions process of the typical selective college could be made more transparent while acknowledging that there are concerns about applicant privacy, et cetera, that limit the extent of true transparency? Yeah, um, in, in my ideal, um, I'd have a very clear articulation of the, 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 the array of mission interests, not just the diversity interests, but clearly the diversity interests that go into um, the class, um, again, that these admissions teams are trying to assemble. Some people are going to get in. Lots of qualified people at selective institutions are not going to get in, right? You cannot admit all qualified applicants. So the question is what judgment you're making around what set of factors in that context. Um, the models I like the best are when I then see an institution take that more generic global sense of sort of mission and goals and collapse it into a set of what are the qualities of students we're looking for? Who are the students? What kind of backgrounds? What kind of interests? Um, and that you get a little more concrete there. And then you then articulate and here are the factors we consider and why. It's not just I'm considering X, Y, and Z. Um, here's the rationale for considering X, Y, and Z. 
and you know, I'll go back to demonstrate just how old I am or how much of a nerd I am, but I, I remember this policy um, in great detail. One of my favorite ever admissions policies um, that I've ever read or been part of, of developing was um, the University of Michigan's law school policy in Grutter. And what I loved about that policy, which was quite extensive, um, and frankly, unlike almost any I think I've ever seen, was not only that it talked about the institutional goals and it talked about the importance of many factors and it um, emphasized the, the importance of, of grades and emphasized the importance of tests and emphasized the importance of lots of other background elements, but it then surfaced actual concrete examples scrubbed for identity to say, and this is how this principle or this interest plays out in our process. And here's student A and here's student B and here's student C. And this is what was decided and here's why. It gives a kind of almost tangible feel to the process in a way that I think is um, materially shapes an understanding that you don't often get from colleges and universities. Thank you. Um, an additional question, um, in your opening remarks, Art Coleman discussed the way um, that universities should avoid using race mechanically per the Grutter decisions and the Fisher decision interpreting it. I understand that many, that many say that some institutions that claim that they're using race flexibly and holistically are in fact, when you look carefully at their numbers and the consistency in their outcomes across years, that they are actually using it mechanically. I believe Rehnquist raised this point in his dissent in Grutter. I'm curious what you both think of this claim. I think you've, you've always got to go behind the numbers, like um, numbers, statistics as the court in, I think in both um, of these cases said provide important information but they don't define the totality of the information so the, the mere fact you've got consistency um, as I think was true in the law school um, example doesn't tell you that somehow there's this mechanical um, um, operation at play and I think in fact the, the majority opinion in Grutter um, um, rebutted that point so I would always consider um, data and numbers to be the flag or a trigger for further inquiry, but I don't think you can step back and say the numbers look like they they're, look like this. Therefore, there's discrimination. Um, if that were the case, then the disparate impact standard, which is triggered by uh, statistical discrepancies, um, would then be the foundation for defining discrimination, and that's not the case there either. Well, I think you will inevitably see quota like thinking because I question the extent of the educational benefits of diversity um, as conceived of by these universities. But I think at least part of the motivation for these policies, I think, is just political in terms of, I guess, what you might call PR or virtue signaling or whatever terminology you want to use, which is that if the race doesn't look a certain way, then we've seen this all before in the New York Times. X percentage of this institution is this, right? This many percentage of uh, you know, law firm partners are women, or this many percentage of law firm partners are people of color. And um, to, in order to avoid that criticism, you're gonna have to take whatever steps it takes to get the numbers up. And so that seems mechanical to me. That seems like a quota because I mean, quite frankly, if, if you didn't have the numbers and the outcome, you would be criticized as to whether you were even doing this race conscious or whatever con you know, identity conscious policy correctly, or, or they, are they even doing it if, if the numbers don't look different? So I think there's a political criticism component to that. Um, and should a school be allowed to, to consider that? I, I can see why they would want to in terms of, you know, if it's a private university, they got to compete in the marketplace for donor dollars and prestige. If it's a public university, they have to appease the legislature and uh, get funding. And I've, I'll just say here in Texas, University of Texas and Texas A&M, they, they know how to play that political game well. They got lobbyists in the Capitol, they, they, the football game, box seats. I've never seen that much political activity in, in, uh, you know, in one place. Uh, it's just not that different from the Capitol. And so these, it's about maximizing their power in kind of a political way. And so what you end up seeing is in the same way you might figure out, you know, who do we endorse for a, a campaign or who do we feature in a political slogan or who do we appoint? And you see those identity politics 
come in there in terms of trying to be popular as a political party, um, you see that same kind of thinking come to university. So then the question is, uh, is that what we want our universities to be doing? And, and in my mind, it shouldn't be. I think I can understand why in politics you might do that because you're, again, we're a democracy. And so we have to make those calculations as to what's popular. Um, but it, it, I think education is supposed to be something that transcends race. And so I, I a law review article that I, I wrote, um, W.E.B. Du Bois in the Souls of Black Folks talks about how when he's reading Aristotle and, and, and the great books, for a moment, this veil, which obscures his ability to, to his interactions with people of other races, it lifts and we're all just discussing ideas. And, and this is something that carries us outside of that, at least in this context while we're having this educational discussion. And unfortunately, I think when you allow, when you prioritize part of your educational mission as this political kind of diversity, I think you end up politicizing campuses more and it detracts from what I, I ultimately think, you know, higher education should be something that transcends race, that we're all, we're all studying the same curriculum, whether it's in the sciences, the natural world, uh, these great books, these ideas that ought to persist regardless of time over centuries, um, regardless of your race, that there's something worth studying there that transcends all of that. I'll just, I'll say, um, you, you referred to like the, the focus on diversity as what's popular, you know, in both my lived experience and my worldview, it's also what's important. Like, I don't think you have the Fortune 500 companies and others are retired military generals that have weighed in and Gruder and Gratz and Fisher, and I would guess are going to in the UNC and Herbert cases, talking about the imperative of um, diversity um, with a focus on racial and ethnic diversity for their organizational and institutional success being simple sort of politics or popularity. Um, I think there is an actual intrinsic reality. Um, we won't get into it today. I think there's a foundation of um, systemic um, discrimination and racism that undergirds a lot of this, but that's not really the, the focus here is less about that, although it's connected to it. And it's about sort of what we are achieving both educationally and ultimately for the workforce and for, for civic engagement in a world that is increasingly connected and in a society that is increasingly diverse. And so this notion of a, a kind of sort of neutral science, I'm putting words a bit in your mouth, but you know, let's the same science for everybody. Like what about the medical conditions that never surfaced um, that affect women uniquely or certain races uniquely until they were part of the medical school cohort? Like you get a, you get a richness, you get a, a breadth of perspective you get a different lived experience that comes to the table for better decision-making on a lot of fronts. And so um, I think there's a real grounded reality um, in that not only from, from education, but to the professional world of traditionally conservative corporate America that is weighing in pretty strongly um, on this set of issues. Thanks. Since we have just a few minutes left, I'm going to turn to some of the questions for the audience. One question asks about the tension between the diversity goal and the rise of some racially separate affinity groups, dorms, graduation ceremonies on campus. If a university claims to be motivated by diversity, but then undertakes these programs that seem to undercut racial mixing or racial cross socialization across races, to what extent can they validly claim to be motivated by diversity and admissions goals? I would say, I think it's at least theoretically possible you can do both depending on your sort of broader design. Um, but I will also say this, and, and I had some experience with this um, in my OCR days in the dark ages. Um, like in my view, under Title VI and equal protection, but particularly under Title VI, um, institutions can't come in and then say, you know, I'm creating this organization or this enterprise within my institution and only students of X color can join. Like it's gotta be open and maybe focused on it as a matter of subject matter, um, as a matter of interest by students that may attract certain students by race or ethnicity more than others. Um, but the notion that somehow you can say, um, you know, this class or this program or this student activity um, is limited only to certain students based on race. Um, I was part of a lot of conversations and enforcement actions where um, we said that would not hold up under Title VI. Thank you. 
I can't really speak to the issue of graduation um, in, in other sort of broader programs like that because I'm not um, familiar with those details, but I'll tell you a lot of program act design questions. Um, my very fervent view is that door has to be open, even though it can be targeted as a matter of subject matter um, or educational focus. Uh, I suppose it, true diversity means making room for self people's free decision to self segregate in that way. I, I don't know. Um, I was just, I'll just say from my own experience, I've, I've never, I, I certainly do share an affinity with other Asian Americans, but I'm also, I've never made that one of my principal social groups just because I, I don't see the value in, in limiting your, the people you associate with to just such a small percentage of the population. Um, so I, I, I think that certainly, uh, the extent to which you have separate dorms or graduation, right? I think that's a uh, troubling phenomenon and not really serving the minority's best interests because, um, you know, I think we have to be able to know how to interact with people from backgrounds, but that's just kind of, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting in some ways, diversity sows the seeds of its own destruction, right? That in that by, I think in a truly diverse population where different groups and different, you know, ideas are allowed to flourish, you're gonna find the rise of more, um, whether it's like you know black nationalism or white nationalism or different sort of ethnic identity uh, uh, groups, I think the more race conscious we are, I think that it, it does give rise to that type of discourse. Um, and so, I, I certainly am not in favor of that. But it seems to be where we are today. Thank you. Uh, we've gotten a couple of audience questions about cases where racial preferences and class preferences would seem to cut in opposite directions. There are questions about the fairness of giving large preferences to applicants who may be from an underrepresented racial group but come from privileged backgrounds versus those who may, uh, versus the, those children of recent, of say recent immigrants who come from poor backgrounds, but are from a group that's what for racial group that's represented or over or, or quote overrepresented. I wondered if you can speak to the tension um, in these cases and whether you think that current practices as pract at most universities are fair in this regard. Yeah, I don't. My experience, um, and that's all I can speak to, obviously, my experience is not that you've got this sort of categorical, categorical divide in that way, because um, it goes back to sort of this integrated set of factors. Um, I will say, um, with respect to, um, you know, students of color who may be more affluent versus not, I mean, one of my critiques for much of the, the dialogue um, over time has been the assumption that um, the consideration of racial experiences and backgrounds from all economic backgrounds can't be at play. I actually think the term affirmative action is a misnomer for what we are actually talking about in these cases. This is not a remedial designed program. This is not fixing you know, issues of social justice from the past. It is a forward-looking mission-driven educational goal. And I think in that context, you are looking for students of color who bring affluence. You are looking for students of color um, who don't. Um, you're looking at that sort of broad range and mix because that's the, the, the core of the design. So I don't see it in, in those kind of categorical terms because that's just not the way I experience the work of admission officers in that way. Well, I think if I'm understanding the question correctly, um, it's about to what extent socioeconomic diversity can be seen as uh, mapping onto racial diversity. But I, I think... I think it's noble and depending on the university's mission to want to bring in students from underprivileged backgrounds socioeconomically, I think I can, I can see where that comes from. I don't think race is a perfect proxy for socioeconomic status, as you said, um, you can have privileged students who are minorities and white students who are come from very underprivileged backgrounds and had a lot of difficulty growing up. So I, I think I could be in support of socioeconomic diversity policies that, especially I think at State University where there is some consideration that uh, state funded activities ought to prioritize, um, you know, whether it's the entire geography of the state, uh, all these different communities that don't get um, as, as many benefits or as many privileges and that have suffered disproportionately certain um, hardships. Um, so I can see the value of that, but I, I still think there's gonna be that 
New York Times headline or the Twitter thing that says X percentage of the school is this. And that, that type of discourse is, is just very common. I think anyone who finds themselves in the hot seat of having to make these difficult decisions will be the recipient of that type of criticism. And so that will inevitably give rise to the question of, do we take an any means necessary approach to get the numbers to look a certain way? Or do we live with that criticism and you know, understand that well, well sometimes, you know, not every institution is going to be this perfect match of the demographics of the community. And sometimes if you try to force it, it's going to give rise to uh, problems. And so, uh, so I, I think part of it is just recognizing that, um, that there are those downsides that, that aren't often talked about um, in terms of what has to be done to accomplish making the, the school look a certain way or get to these X percentages. And, and uh, it's, it's sort of... It, you know, whenever you, you politically, whether it's a corporation or a political party running a country, you set a goal and you, and you don't sort of describe what it takes to get there. You just look at the number of the outcome, whether, you know, my, my parents grew up in a communism. Is we're going to surpass Great Britain in five years, right? They just, so someone just said that because it sounded good and it was political. And then what they ended up doing was they had to export all their food and then you know, people ended up starving to death because they were trying to accelerate the growth of industrialization so fast. And so whenever you have that kind of just throwing out numbers as targets, I get very worried at what the costs are. Uh, and the purpose of me kind of doing these uh, talks is just to, to highlight them and to show that there are costs to achieving these goals, whatever the intentions, however noble they might be. All right, I think we are past one o'clock and this was supposed to be a one hour long presentation. I think we've had a lively discussion and gotten lots of great questions from the audience. Uh, thanks to all who attended. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks to our speakers for your illuminating perspectives. And on behalf of the Federalist Society, I would like to thank our experts as well for the benefit of their valuable time and expertise today. And I would like to thank the audience for joining us and for participating, especially with all those great questions. We welcome listener feedback by email at info at fed-soc.org. As always, please keep an eye out on our website and your emails for announcements about upcoming webinars. Thank you for joining us today. We are adjourned.